Good morning. My name is Steve Rosenbaum, a member of the 1978 Honors Class and Chief of the Special Litigation Section. Welcome to Passing the Torch, an event celebrating the life of James P. Turner, and a special work welcome to Jim's family, his wife, his brother, all four of his children, um, grandchildren and great-grandchildren are in the room and others are joining us on Zoom. It is fitting that this event to honor Jim is the first event co-sponsored by the Civil Rights Division and the Civil Rights Division Alumni Association. We are pleased to have as our speakers, Brian Landsberg, former chief of the appellate section, Loretta King, former deputy assistant attorney general, and Kristen Clark, the assistant attorney general for the Civil Rights Division. To get us started, here's a little background about Jim. He started his career as an honors hire in the tax division in 1956, and after five years, decided to try private practice in Colorado. He joined the Civil Rights Division in 1965, nine years out of law school, but he started as a GS-14. He was part of a group of lawyers hired to enforce the Civil Rights Act of 1964, though he started his career working on the killing of Viola Liuza, a Detroit mother of five who had traveled to Alabama to join the march from Selma to Montgomery for voting rights. Jim monitored two unsuccessful state prosecutions and worked on the successful federal prosecution under the leadership of John Doerr. I encourage you to read his book about his experience. He became the career deputy assistant attorney general in 1969 when the division had about 75 line lawyers. He served in that role for nearly 25 years until his retirement in 1994 working with seven different assistant attorneys general. His tenure included long stints as acting assistant attorney general at the start of the Bush administration, and again at the start of the Clinton administration. Today, we wanna to honor the man and his achievements. We call the event Passing the Torch because perhaps that is his greatest legacy, setting the high standards for career staff through his leadership, mentorship, an unwavering commitment to the laws the division enforces. For example, let me share a remembrance by a 1980 honors hire. The attorney recalls, I remember meeting Jim on my very first day in the Civil Rights Division. After telling him that I was born and raised in Gary, he told me about his voting rights work in Gary when Richard Hatcher first ran to be Gary's mayor. He was so passionate about that work that he made a young black lawyer from a law school in the hinterlands feel right at home. Without this first encounter, I am not sure that I would have found my professional footing as quickly as I did. The attorney is Clifford Johnson, who was sworn in as US attorney for the Northern District in Indiana just last month. And here's another example. In 2007, Jim spoke at the Great Hall event celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Division. He offered this simple advice to then Attorney General Michael Mukasey and Acting Assistant Attorney General Grace Chung Becker. Jim said, always look to the enforcement of every civil rights law passed by Congress. The division succeeds when it is true to this, its basic purpose. The corollary rule is that the good men and women of the division will know when the rule is being followed. I am sharing Master of Ceremony duties today with Paul Hancock. For those who don't know Paul, he served in the division from 1970 to 1997. He worked in the education section and then was assistant for litigation in the voting section. He became chief of the housing and civil enforcement section in 1988. He led the section's enforcement of the recently enacted Fair Housing Act amendments and the development of the section's first major fair lending cases. He ended his division career as an acting deputy assistant attorney general. After his retirement, he joined the Florida attorney general's office and handled the Supreme Court argument in Bush versus Gore. He is now a partner at KNL Eights and serves as co-vice co-president along with Margot Schlanger of the Civil Rights Division Alumni Association. It is my pleasure to turn things over to Paul. Thank you, Steve, and I also welcome all of you. Um, Jim Turner certainly was a foundational pillar of the Civil Rights Division. His career was remarkable. And I also wanna emphasize the part of it that Steve did about passing the torch. 
I mean, Jim worked with the legendary leaders of the Civil Rights Division from John Doerr to Burke Marshall to Steve Pollack. They established the standards of developing cases based on sound factual development of cases that has prevailed through generations and remains in the division today. That methodology led to new legislation that further enhanced the power of the federal government to enforce civil rights laws. And Jim was a, just a phenomenal person in passing it on to others. Um, Brian Landsberg, who himself is a renowned figure in the Civil Rights Division, will be our first speaker. Um, Brian has told me many times in the past that he viewed Jim as his mentor. Um, when I joined the division, Brian was my mentor. I learned a lot how to practice law from Brian Landsberg. After trying school desegregation cases for about six years, um, Jim Turner called me and asked me to take a new position of, of director of litigation for the voting program. I told him I couldn't do it because I had decided and accepted a position back in my hometown of Toledo to practice law and I was planning to leave the department. Jim and his voice that, that I can't replicate but many of us heard said, well, Paul, you know, maybe could you do it for a year, help us get started and then you can go back to Toledo. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And after, after starting that position and having so much fun, I stayed another 20 years. And, 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 and shortly after I started that position, um, I also was working with our hiring committee and I placed a phone call to a young law student at the University of Michigan to offer him a position under the Attorney General's Honor Program and that was Steve Rosenbaum. And Steve came to the division and has now been with the division for more than 40 years. So those, that's just one branch, one small branch of how this division has operated over generations and, and how it's passed the torch from, from one generation to the next. I'm really, you know, we had difficulty planning and scheduling this event. We wanted to have a huge reception here in the Great Hall, but couldn't do it because of the pandemic. We didn't know when we were gonna be able to do it and finally came up with this hybrid event where we have a small number of people here. We're limited by the government as to how many people can be here live, but we have a great number of people participating virtually by Zoom. And the outcome or the, the attendance here is more than we expected. We have probably over 350 people joining this, most, most of them by Zoom, but a few family and, and other people here in the Great Hall. Um, and the, the divide of people, we, we try to find out who's, who's tuning in, who's listening, and just looking at email addresses, we estimate that probably about half of them are current career uh, current uh, employees of the Civil Rights Division and the other half are alumni of the division. So that's a pretty good divide and I think it, it epitomizes what we're trying to convey here and that is the torch is passed from lawyer to lawyer, from class to class, but the, the method of operation and how to develop cases remains the same. So let me turn it over to a person I really admire very much, and that's Brian Landsberg. And I said, Brian um, has had a lot of positions in the Civil Rights Division. When I joined, he was Chief of the Education Section. He's probably best known for being the longtime Chief of the Appellate Section. But even Jim Turner brought him back to help run the division when, when one of Jim's many stints as Acting Assistant Attorney General. So Brian, it's all yours. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Steve, for arranging this. So in 1940, when James P. Turner was 10 years old, Attorney General Robert Jackson described the person Jim would become in language that still resonates. The qualities of a good prosecutor are as elusive and impossible to define as those which mark a gentleman. A sensitiveness to fair play and sportsmanship is perhaps the best protection against the abuse of power. And the citizen's safety lies in the prosecutor who tempers zeal with minimum, with human kindness, who seeks truth and not victims, who serves the law and not factional purposes, and who approaches his task with humility. Jim served 17 attorneys general, from Herbert Brownell to Janet Reno. He exemplified the good prosecutor and the model civil servant. 
Jim embodied dedication to the rule of law, a long view of the arc of justice, and cool courage under fire. When political pressures led the Civil Rights Division astray, as sometimes happened, Jim counseled the long view, confident that the rule of law would prevail. And we can learn much about how to serve the public interest from his two books, his autobiography, The Other Side of the Mountain, which he wrote in 2008, and Selma and the Liuzzo murder trials, which came out a decade later. Jim served as a trial attorney, a section chief, a deputy assistant attorney general, and so many times as acting assistant attorney general. How did he survive periodic changes of policy on hot button issues? He did it by staying true to three principles. First, the Civil Rights Division must enforce civil rights. Second, the division's actions must be based on facts and the law. And third, within the constraints of the first two principles, each administration is entitled to advance its policies and set its priorities. And Jim's adherence to these principles brought him the respect of career staff and political appointees alike through many changes of administration. Jim began his legal career as a DOJ tax division lawyer, then had private practice in Denver for a short period. And John Doerr hired Jim as a lawyer in the Civil Rights Division, as Steve mentioned, to help with the enforcement of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. He came to the division two weeks before Selma's Bloody Sunday of March 7, 1965, when, as Jim wrote, Alabama police beat and gassed John Lewis and several hundred other voting rights demonstrators back to their churches. In the subsequent march from Selma to Montgomery, Ku Klux Klan members killed Viola Liuzzo and Jim's first assignment called upon his diplomatic skills. He was in effect the federal ambassador to the state of Alabama's prosecutors who sought to convict the, convict the Klansmen. And when the state court failed to convict, Jim helped John Doerr secure the 1965 conviction that in the words of New York Times reporter Roy Reed, ended a hundred years of Klan immunity to the, to the sting of justice. This was the first of many high profile cases assigned to Jim. He viewed it as his most important case, one that heralded the birth of a brand new tradition of equal justice under the law. Jim's next high profile case required him to develop the facts showing a conspiracy to deprive Richard Hatcher, an African-American candidate for mayor of South Bend, Indiana, of the election. As Jim later wrote, the white democratic establishment sent out the word there would be no black mayor. Opponents tried to use ghost voters, fictitious or past residents, plus, plus a purge of legitimate voters in black precincts to elect Hatcher's opponent, the incumbent mayor. In one long night, true to civil rights division experience in voting rights cases in the deep south, Jim and a crew of FBI agents found more than 800 fraudulent application forms. He then chased down a federal judge at a Notre Dame football game to schedule an emergency hearing. And because of Jim's work on the case, Hatcher became one of the first black mayors in the urban South. And Jim became known as a troubleshooter. He was sent to evaluate civil unrest in Newark, in Detroit. He was assigned to help devise a plan to handle the anti-war march on the Pentagon. He watched with horror as Chicago police 
beat protesters at the 1968 Democratic Convention. He would later write about the failure of the justice system as eight prosecutions for that police brutality and ended in acquittals. During the Nixon administration, he directed the inconclusive grand jury investigation of the Chicago police killing of two Black Panthers. And next came, came Kent State. Although the division initially declined to prosecute the National Guard members who massacred students at Kent State, Jim supervised the case when it was reopened in 1973 and was present when the grand jury indicted 10 guardsmen in 1974. The division's trial team presented strong evidence of guilt, but the trial judge dismissed the case without allowing the jury to consider the evidence. As Jim later lamented, despite a small settlement and an apology from the Ohio governor, when the Kent State cases finally ended after years of legal battling, there was pitifully little justice. And these cases must have taken a toll on Jim, but he never ceased his legal efforts to help our society de deal with its discrimination against the racial and ethnic minorities, women, the handicapped, and others. In a recognition of Jim's skill as an advocate, he was assigned to represent the United States before the Supreme Court four times. Normally, the government is represented by lawyers from the Solicitor General's office, or sometimes by an assistant attorney general, very occasionally by a career lawyer. For a career lawyer to argue once is unusual, but four times? And these were important cases spanning both Republican and Democratic administrations. In the very first case, Jim argued, Albemarle Paper Company against Moody. The court adopted his argument that victims of employment discrimination should normally be made whole through an award of back pay, a decision that has led to many thousands of employees receiving back pay relief. Along the way, Jim made friends with a varied crew indeed. His first book recounts his friendship with Republican Assistant Attorney General Stan Pottinger and John Dunn, as well as his close relationships with Democratic Assistant Attorneys General Steve Pollack and Drew Days, and with Leroy Moton, the survivor of the attack that took Viola Liuzzo's life after the Selma March. He traveled with the Reverend Jesse Jackson. He took his wife, Anita, to meet his friend, Fannie Lou Hamer, the inspiring leader of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Most important were the relationships Jim formed with colleagues in the Civil Rights Division, from his assistants, Sudi Hooper and Regina Montgomery, to career and political staff alike, Bob Murphy, Nick Flannery, Lynn Walker, John Huerta, to name a few. I served as his deputy more than once, and our families shared happy and sad occasions, including the illness and death of his wife, Jean, and the marriage of Jim and Anita. I learned that dedication to one's job as a civil servant need not interfere with dedication to family. Jim fiercely protected his family time and often shared his pride in his children, Jim, Kurt, Barbara, and Amy, and their spouses. He treasured his family trips to Florida and to Southern Shores, North Carolina, and he proudly announced the exploits of his grandchildren. In his role as a Civil Rights Division attorney and leader, Jim exhibited consummate professionalism and a poker face choosing his words carefully, never engaging in idle gossip, but focusing always on law, facts, and strategy. Jim spoke softly, 
but in the language of leadership. In his role as a devoted family person, Jim shed the seriousness and exhibited another side. My children remember visiting his farm where they helped churn the ice cream and got a ride on Barbara's horse. Jim loved nature. He built a beautiful home deep in the woods, sparing as many trees as he could. A sitting room was situated facing a magnificent beech tree that Jean admired. He later added a patio to celebrate Anita's graduation from law school. And Jim's devotion to the Civil Rights Division did not end with his retirement party, which was held in this very great hall. He took a leading role in forming the Civil Rights Division Association, an organization of former and current employees of the division, and served as chair of the association for many years, guiding the arrangements for reunions and substantive programs. He returned to Selma in 2015 with his son, Jim, to observe President Obama speak at the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Just three years ago, he traveled to New Richmond, Wisconsin to help inaugurate the John Doerr History Trail. Jim also expressed concern over the politicization of the Office of Assistant Attorney General writing that the office had evolved from a non-political director of the federal government's role in the civil rights revolution to a high visibility appointment used by the political parties to send rancorous domestic policy signals. He said, as one who watched it all, I am persuaded that the country would benefit greatly from a return to the earlier model. In 2008, Jim published his autobiography, which toggles between his family life and his professional life. Roy Reed, his friend who had covered the South as a reporter for the New York Times, called the book a bruising but inspiring account of one lawyer's long career in pursuing justice for those in the nation's cellar. Reed added that the book was a reminder that the federal bureaucracy, endlessly abused in the public mind, is filled with honorable, decent, and absolutely necessary people like Jim Turner. As Congressman John Lewis, who survived many beatings as a civil rights activist observed, Jim's book about the Liuzzo case calls each of us to recommit ourselves to do all we can to finish the work begun at Selma. Jim dedicated the book, quote, to the committed men and women of the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division who spent the last 55 years building a permanent constitutional law enforcement program. And he closed that dedication by simply saying, it was an honor for me to work with them. Well, it was an honor for us to work with Jim. May the memory of Jim's dedication inspire future enforcers of our civil rights law. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. That was certainly a moving presentation. I just want to give one lighter remembrance of Jim that this is a story that he liked to recount when we would get together after years after we both left the division. And it dates back to the Reagan administration when Brad Reynolds was the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. I mean, Brad wasn't held in high regard by most civil rights organizations and he had tense relationships. But one of the people he really hit it off with was Jesse Jackson. Brian mentioned that Jim had traveled with Jesse and, and had a good relationship and that was passed on to Brad. And after a couple meetings here in the department, uh, Jesse invited Brad to come to Mississippi to tour the Delta region to hear firsthand the concerns of black residents about redistricting plans that were harming black voters. Brad agreed to do it. And of course, Jim went along to be the referee. Jerry Jones, the chief of the voting section went along and I got to tag along also. 
it was a remarkable trip. We were, we were traveling from rural county to rural county in a Winnebago, um, meeting with residents of the, of the counties in the church, and we were way behind schedule. It was way behind schedule. We were all in a Winnebago with the driver racing through these rural roads in Mississippi to try to get to the church on time, even though we were really late. And it was in, Jesse Jackson was sitting in the front seat on one side and Brad was on the other side and Jim was in between them. And they were, Brad and Jesse were arguing strongly about the benefits of affirmative action. I don't have to describe each of their positions, but they were going at it pretty hard. It was a torrential rainstorm at the time and all of a sudden lightning and thunder struck at the same time. The driver of the Winnebago almost lost control of the vehicle and it swerved from side to side, but he was able to keep it on the road. And without missing a beat, Jesse Jackson said, see Brad, God don't like that shit you're saying. <laughs> Jim, everybody cracked up. Jim got the, the piece that he wanted and they went on to arguing about the benefits of affirmative action. Jim was just a great referee. And when, when we came back, when, when, when Brad and the others came back from that trip to Mississippi, it caused Brad to enter a lot of objections after the to redistricting plans based on the 1980 census, based on the, that they failed to show there was not a discriminatory purpose in enacting the plan, even if it was not otherwise retrogressive. And it also led to an, an objection that I remember Jim arguing very strongly for to the Georgia Congressional Redistricting Plan following the 1980 census. I remember sitting in Jim's office when Jim was telling Brad why he should have objected this plan. And it was a tough objection because um, um, a black uh, person had already been elected to serve the district in Mississippi, Andrew Young, when the district had a lower black population and this plan increased it, but it still, there was really strong suggestions as much as you can get at the administrative stage of discriminatory purpose. Uh, Jim convinced Brad to interpose that objection. It led to litigation that was, became known as Bubsy versus Smith, where a three judge court upheld the objection. It was affirmed by the Supreme Court. The, the district as revived elected, the first election under that district, John Lewis was elected to serve the district and he continued to serve in Congress until his death. And it all re relates back to the work of Jim Turner. Are we gonna, okay, go, go ahead. Thanks, Brian, for your remarks and, and Paul for that remembrance. Um, a word to the folks who are um, watching on Zoom. Um, if you have something you would like to add or remembrance of, of Jim's uh, life, please put it in the chat. We're gonna save the chat and um, share it with the family um, afterwards. Um, so there are, um, I wanna acknowledge, there are at least three former assistants attorney general who are watching on Zoom. Um, Steve Pollack, um, uh, Bill Lan Lee, who served in the Clinton administration, and um, Stan Pottinger, who served during the second term of the Nixon and the, and the Ford administration. Um, Stan sent these comments, which I'm pleased to read. Um, Jim and I made a great team of Mr. Out Inside and Mr. Outside, with, the attending with his attending primarily to the high quality of the work by the division, while I attended primarily to policy initiatives and the protection of the division from outside influence. The result was a historic reignition of the division's mission, including the previously stalled Kent State case and many other cases waiting to be filed. His contribution to the civil rights of the country was remarkable, as was his personal friendship and good humored sound judgment. He will continue to be sorely missed. And I would take, like to take a, a moment now to also recognize some special people who um, rose to positions of authority in 1969 when Jim became the Deputy Assistant Attorney General. Um, the section, the, the division previously had been organized geographically um, and it had shifted in 1969 to substantive um, sections, that many of which still exist today, um, voting, employment, housing. Um, and there are some true, truly remarkable um, career leaders of the division who were first appointed in 1969, um, beginning with Brian, who was appointed to be the chief of the education section, became chief of the appellate section a few years later. Um, Frank Schwelb, who was chief of the housing section and went on to um, serve in the DC court system for many years. Um, and my first two chiefs, 
um, Dave Rose uh, of the appellate section and Jerry Jones of the voting section. Um, Dave is just a, a brilliant, brilliant lawyer and great strategist and tactician. And um, I le learned so much about putting together a case from him. And, and, and Jerry Jones was there for every single Section 5 objection from 1969 until, um, until I took over for him in 1992. Um, just a constant steady presence. And Paul and I had a chance to visit with him recently on the occasion of Jerry's 90th a birthday, and I'm pleased to report he is doing really well. Um, now it's uh, my turn to introduce the person who succeeded Jim, Loretta King. Um, like me, she's from Brooklyn and was an honors hire. So I probably don't need to say any more than to let you know how terrific she is. Um, she, is uh, she is truly a remarkable person. She joined the division. Um, in the same class as Clifford Johnson in 1980, worked in the employment section, um, made a detour to the civil division for a few years, um, came back to work with me in the voting section um, as my deputy, and then within two years, she became my boss. Um, so one of those lessons is always be nice to the people you supervise, you never know, they may be supervising you. Um, she, she is a, a woman of extraordinary accomplishments. She served 17 years as the career deputy assistant attorney general um, in good times and in bad times. She was always, always, always um, supportive of the career chiefs who worked with her and advancing their programs when it was easy and when it was hard. Um, it is my pleasure to bring to the podium my good friend, Loretta King. Thank you, Steve. Let me start by saying that Jim is my friend. I use the present tense on purpose. Even though his physical presence is no longer with us, his spirit remains in the hearts and memories of the people in this room and the people in the virtual space. And among the many people he championed and advocated for throughout his many decades. His spirit certainly lives in, in me. You may be wondering, what is this unusual friendship between Loretta and Jim? Well, first let me tell you what it was not. We were not the type of friends who told one another our deepest secrets, nor were we the type of friends who regularly chatted on the telephone. But whenever we saw one another, we greeted each other with a friendly hug and special understanding because we shared an extraordinary and sometimes tumultuous experience like no other as career deputy assistant attorney general throughout a range of political persuasions. But before we became friends, we lived in parallel universes. When I was a little girl jumping rope and playing tag, Jim was already in the civil rights division fighting to help America realize the ideals of inalienable rights and all men are created equal doctrines set forth by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence but not originally meant to apply to all people. He was working to manifest the intent of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments of our con Constitution. As the manager in the division, Jim and his colleagues, including Brian Landsberg, sent buses to my neighborhood that took me and other Black children to the better funded schools that finally integrated their student body in the late 1960s. Thank you, Jim's family, for indulging his travels across the country to enforce the fundamental right to vote, to prosecute murderers, and to supervise the vindication of Rodney King. While Jim was on one track enforcing our nation's federal civil rights laws, I was on another, breaking through the cracked and broken walls of discrimination, walking and sometimes running through the doors Jim and his colleagues opened. One day there was a shift in the direction of the parallel universes in which Jim and I lived. They suddenly crossed and I met Jim on my very first day of justice. Unfortunately, his work had created a monster formed from the many years of his and his colleagues' lawsuits, motions, depositions, briefs, findings of facts, conclusions of law, and proposed orders, etc. In his office stood a confident but naive African-American female attorney 
newly hired by the Department of Justice. I walked in taking exception to the section to which I was assigned and I was sent to see Jim. I don't think Jim was ready to meet a product of his life's work. So he made me wait for what seemed like hours. Finally, I walked into his big office, sat across the conference table and stated my objection. In his mumbling voice, he said, go to the voting section and see how you like it. If you don't like it, and all I can say is dot, 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 because frankly, I don't know what Jim promised me. The years passed, but in 1990, Jim was very kind to me as I was about to leave the division. He tried to dissuade me from leaving and told me I was always welcome to come back. Jim was part of the ominous front office, at least that's how the office appeared to most line attorneys. But in 1994, the universe shifted again and thrust me into, into Jim's track. God blessed me with the opportunity to follow in his footsteps. He did not know that all the work he'd done was planning his succession. I also learned that while Jim's victories were many, few people knew or few people know what Jim faced in the front office during those tumultuous times. But having been in the same position, I was revealed, I, I received a revelation. And I can tell you, a deputy assistant attorney is lonely at times. And I'm sure that Jim was lonely at times. No one knows about the many private battles he confronted, fought behind closed doors in the face of administrations, hostile or oblivious to the purpose for which he was there. He faced administrations that came in with agendas to chip away the 1964 Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and at worst, to make them ineffective. Yet Jim persevered. Administrations insisted upon no more goals and timetables, yet Jim persevered. Administrations that wanted to dismiss consent decrees even when their jobs were not yet done, yet Jim persevered. Administrations that refused to cite seminal Supreme Court cases that established sound principles of jurisprudence, yet Jim persevered. And when he was not invited to be in a room where it happened, Jim persevered. The world has significantly changed since Jim fought for justice and equality, since he stared discrimination in the face. We live in a much more inclusive America now than ever, but there is still work to be done. While we have many hardworking and dedicated police officers serving our communities, we still have far too many shootings and killing, killings of black males and females by the hand or knee of law enforcement. Black Lives Matter. While su white, white supremacist groups have been emboldened, spreading lies and propagating bogus replacement theories, black mothers are fearful for their black children wearing masks or jogging through neighborhoods because they are afraid that they may be mistaken for someone up to no good and shot like Ahmaud Arbery. White privilege abounds. COVID has disproportionately sizzled through communities of color like a burning fire, killing many in its path. And restrictive voting laws are permeating throughout the country, diminishing our democracy, and again, disenfranchising voters of color. Jim did his part. It's time for him to rest. But don't let his work be in vain. Those of you who are still in the division in our virtual audience or in our present audience, continue the fight that presents itself in this 21st century America. To come full circle about our, our world, Jim and I sought physical therapy at the same facility. When he saw my name on the registration, he told them that he knew me, that he was my friend. When I saw his name, I said the same. The therapist dismissed our statements. In their mind, there was no way that a tall white man, 25 years my senior, could be friends with a short black woman, 25 years his junior. But when we showed up at the same time and gave one another a hug, they were astonished. Unconscious bias had invaded and skewed their thinking. They made assumptions that had no basis in fact. Our perceived unlikely friendship taught them a lesson that they will carry throughout their lives. So in addition to the overt racism and, the, and discrimination that continues to exist in our society, you guys have the burden of fighting unconscious bias as well. You must litigate and educate until America is indeed a place with liberty 
and justice for all. I am so thankful for Jim and all the work he accomplished throughout the many decades and for blessing my life with his work. I really pray that Jim rests in peace and that his family can be comforted by knowing all the wonderful things he contributed to society and that his life was not in vain. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta, um, for those remarks. Um, let's see. So I want to take a, a, a moment um, to uh, remember uh, Sudi Hooper and uh, Regina Montgomery. Um, Brian mentioned them. Um, they guarded the door to Jim's office. Um, together, they taught a generation of secretaries and quite a few chiefs the importance of high standards and pride in, in your work. In practice, this meant that not one document got to Jim's desk until it was formatted properly and error-free. This, mind you, was well before email, so there was no workaround. And frustrating as it could be, especially on the 60th day when you needed Jim to approve a Section 5 objection letter, it made us all better. Jim taught me um, the power of silence. Um, for those who know me, that's probably a lesson I still need. Um, in, a, in a meeting with the Assistant Attorney General, you don't have to speak first. You certainly don't have to speak the loudest or the longest. Indeed, I learned to wait to see if Jim spoke at all or was saving his counsel for a private meeting with the Assistant Attorney General. But when he did speak, he also brought clarity and focus to the issue. Um, and I would also at this time like to recognize the continuing legacy that Jim started as career deputy assistant attorney general and Loretta carried on. Um, Greg Friel, who succeeded uh, Loretta as deputy assistant attorney general is in the room with us. Um, and Robert Moosey, who became the second career as deputy assistant attorney general is on Zoom. And they have, trust me, carried on the tradition that Jim and Loretta started um, just wonderfully in, in easy times and harder times. Um, it is now my pleasure um, to introduce the Assistant Attorney General of the Civil Rights Division, Kristen Clark. Um, like all great Civil Rights Division lawyers, including Loretta and me, she is from Brooklyn and started her career as an honors hire in the Civil Rights Division. Um, she uh, served in the Civil Rights Division in both the voting and criminal sections. Um, after leaving the division in six, she held in 2006, she held a series of jobs in civil rights organizations um, and government, serving first in the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and then as head of the Civil Rights Bureau for the New York State Attorney General's Office. In 2015, um, she became the president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Um, she's been assistant attorney general um, since the end of May and her first communication um, with uh, the Civil Rights Division staff, she echoed um, what Jim had taught us. She said, our nation benefits when the promise of equal justice under law is made tangible and real for all communities. And she has followed Jim's sage advice. She is ensuring the enforcement of every civil rights law passed by Congress, recognizing that the division succeeds best when it is true to this, its basic purpose. It's my pleasure um, to introduce Kristen Clark. Good morning. It's a pleasure to speak with you today and to be here to celebrate Jim Turner and his extraordinary accomplishments during his long tenure inside the Civil Rights Division. I wanna extend a special welcome to Jim's family, so many of whom are with us today, and maybe just ask you to stand. Jim's dedication to the Civil Rights Division was extraordinary. As you've heard from the other speakers today, Jim's almost 30 year career at the division spanned a wide array of civil rights work, 
including voting rights enforcement, employment discrimination, civil rights prosecutions, including one of the first prosecutions for the killing of a civil rights worker, and challenges to the use of force by law enforcement. And many of the initiatives that Jim spearheaded endure as key areas of focus for the division. His work to promote racial justice, to demand police accountability, and to protect the right to vote remain key priorities of the division today. For example, in line with Jim's work to protect the right to peaceful protest, the division recently opened investigations into the police departments of Minneapolis, Louisville, and Phoenix. Those investigations will assess the use of force of those police departments, including the use of force against individuals engaged in activities protected by the First Amendment, such as engaging in peaceful protest. Similarly, much of the division's current work continues Jim's legacy of promoting racial justice. For example, the division's recently announced Combating Red Line initiative builds on the division's longstanding work that seeks to make mortgage credit and home ownership accessible to all Americans on the same terms, regardless of race or national origin, or regardless of the neighborhood where they live. And protecting the right to vote remains at the core of the division's mission, as demonstrated by recent litigation filed by the division in Georgia and Texas. As I've previously noted, the division will use all the tools we have available to ensure that each eligible citizen can register, cast a ballot, and have that ballot count free from racial discrimination. In addition to Jim's remarkable commitment to justice and the breadth of his work, I want to emphasize that he did all of this as a long-term career attorney. Jim served first as a trial attorney and then as a career deputy assistant attorney general for 25 years. And as you all know, the vast majority of the work conducted by the division today is carried out by career staff. They are the backbone of the division. This is incredibly important because our work is not and should not be driven by politics, but rather by adherence to civil rights law. Jim valued the division's independence and integrity and sought to maintain those principles throughout multiple different administrations and under seven different presidents of both parties. As he noted, quote, other than faithful enforcement, there should be no Republican or Democratic position on civil rights, end quote. That work of ensuring nonpartisan enforcement of civil rights laws, regardless of administration or party in power, remains at the core of our work today. The requirements of the Fair Housing Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act do not change with the new administration, and neither does our work. And the work of career staff is crucial to maintaining both the legitimacy of the division and ensuring the continuity of our work through changes in administration. Further, career staff provide institutional knowledge, advise new leadership, and serve as caretakers for the agency. The division has recognized the importance of the role of career staff, which is so clearly demonstrated by Jim and has expanded the number of career staff in the front office in recognition of the importance of that role. Jim leaves behind a remarkable legacy of public service accomplished in the Civil Rights Division. As I told his wife, his legacy looms heavy. He's truly an inspiration for all of us. As we close today's event, I'd like to leave us with a call to action from Jim. At a 1990 commemoration of the march from Selma to Montgomery, Jim stated, quote, today we join together to renew the overarching commitment to equal justice under law. We know that this goal has yet to be realized, but I hope that each of us leaves here with a revitalized determination to continue the work for the dream of justice and racial understanding envisioned by the marchers from Selma, end quote. 
as staff as at the Civil Rights Division, you have the opportunity to work towards equal justice under law and to safeguard the rights of those most vulnerable among us. Thank you for helping to meet that task each and every day and for carrying forth Jim's extraordinary legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I want to thank um, I want to thank Kristen for allowing us to hold this event here in the Great Hall. I want to thank my uh, colleagues in the Civil Rights Division Association, um, Paul Hancock, who joined us today and has spent a lot of time planning. Margot Schlanger, the co-president. I'd like to thank um, Sui Howe for arranging all the use of the space and all the administrative support um, for. Uh, for us to get this off. I wanna thank all of you who are on Zoom um, and uh, encourage you to add your last thoughts in the chat column. Um, it is truly an honor for me to have been part of this endeavor. Um, Jim is a leader of the division. He is someone I have long um, admired um, as a, and for the work he did and the life he led. Um, may his memory be a blessing to his family um, to his friends, to his colleagues, and may it be a lesson for all of us who are in the Civil Rights Division today. Thank you all very much. Yeah. I wanna thank you all too, and this has really been a great event, and we appreciate the, the cooperation and the partnership with the division to hold this with the Alumni Association. And also I would encourage all of you watching by Zoom today, the current members of the division to join us in the Civil Rights Division Association. It's open to current employees. It's not just meant for, for the alumni. And, and we don't, there's not a lot that we do, but we like to try to plan events to advance civil rights, to remember the work of the division and to talk about where the division should head in the future. So we, you know, we want to keep passing that torch and we encourage all of you to sign up. Thank you. <laughs>